series of programs, I've been promising you this, about people who have made it to the top. Meet the boss, for example. But it always doesn't, or it doesn't always have to be in business as such, in commerce, but it also could be in the arts. And I'm delighted to say one of my favorite guests all, of all time, and I'm not just saying it because he's here, I, I told him that the other day, is that, uh, that on all the people that I've interviewed and, and, and over the last 30 odd years, I've often asked who's my favorite. And I can tell you this, my guest today is way up the top, if not number one with me, Lord Jeffrey Archer. How are you, I Lord am Archer? Right. Thank you very much indeed, that's most kind. A man in lockdown, that must yes, be difficult been, for you. Yep, we've been in lockdown now for uh, nine weeks. Um, and uh, we're very privileged because we're down in beautiful Cambridge, in lovely old Vicarage, and the sun is shining. And out actually, out of the sort of 80 days, whatever it's been, I would say 75 have been the most beautiful weather. So one's been able to go for a long walk. I do an hour's walk in the morning, about three miles. Uh, so during lockdown, I've walked about 250 miles. Well, well, you're looking well, I must say, and you also have the Come opportunity, from. as Come I know, from. we'll talk about that in a moment, to write yet another bestseller. You've sold 330 million copies, maybe more, maybe 331 million, maybe 332. <laughs> We're not going to argue, but 330 million books. Can we go back, Jeffrey, to the very day I picked up that book called Not a Penny Less, Not a Penny More? You were on the verge of bankruptcy, I believe. Correct. Correct. Uh, and you had invested badly, but who knew at the time, into a Canadian company, and it all went haywire. Uh, you had to pick yourself up, which you did. Why did you write a novel? Well, it's a jolly good question, because most intelligent and sensible people wouldn't have done. And if I'd known the facts then that I know now, that only one in a thousand books that get to a publisher, one is published and that one thousand books that are published, one gets on the bestsellers list. And of the thousand books that get on the bestsellers list, one goes to number one. I might well have gone out and got a job as an estate agent because frankly, I didn't know those odds, but I thought the idea for Not A Penny More, Not A Penny Less was quite good for young men who between them had lost a fortune, been stolen by a crook, aimed to get it back not a penny more, not a penny less. Now, I've had a, a film company wanting to do the remake of it, but they've insisted that the four can't be four men any longer. We have to have two men oh dear. Uh, and uh, a lady and uh, a black man as well. And I've said, yes, of course, that'll be absolutely suit me fine. That'll Because you see, I wrote that 45 years ago. So today it would be much more effective with a more diversity uh, group. Lord Geoffrey Archer, as you can see, is with me today. Geoffrey, just you touched on the subject there, and I must ask you, and I, I know because you've been hugely involved in, if that's for me, tell them to hold it. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. There you are, Lord Geoffrey Archer. Geoffrey, uh, mm -hmm. you've touched on the subject just now about the remake, the possible remake of Not A Penny Less, Not A Penny More. But you touched on it by saying you have to have a black man, you have to have a woman, you have to have all the politically correct nonsense that goes on. What's your opinion, if you have an opinion, of course, on what's going on now about this nonsense about him to want to remove statues? Do you, do you applaud well, I think that? that's terrible. Do you support it? And I'm delighted that in London today, those people who are sincere about advancing uh, black people's rights and which they deserve in every way, are not charging up to London to attack Winston Churchill's statue. The people in London today, a much smaller group, many of them are a bunch of thugs just looking for a fight or just looking to be unpleasant. And that's got nothing to do with the fight for the black movement, which I've been involved in all my life and thoroughly approve of. I think if, I mean, I don't have to prove it, not only do I have a black sister adopted, but when I was at Oxford and had the great honor of being president of athletics, my opposite number, Wendell Motley, the great West Indian, uh, a world record holder and Olympic silver medalist, was frankly in a different class to me. 
He then went on to do a PhD. So I know he was in a different class to me and I don't have to have it explained to me. So I've been a great fighter for uh, black rights for many, many years, along with my battle for women's rights. When you're married to Mary, to Mary Archer, again, you realize you're not an equal. <laughs> a good title for a book, by the way, there. I'm not an equal. Among equals. <laughs> now, look, let's just go uh, go back a little bit here. Um, when you wrote this book, not a penny less penny more, I'm fascinated by this because it was sort of giving out the message that you'd like to get all your money back that you invested and you'd be happy with that. So, how much money, can I ask you this? How much money did you invest and lost? And how much money did you make from not a penny less? Don't tell me any more about all your books and your Well, uh, and, uh, I lost 400,000. That's been wow, well reported. It's a lot of money. Uh, Four hundred thousand dollars, and on the first go of not a penny more, not a penny less, I made three thousand pounds. It sold three thousand copies, and then it went into softback, and it sold twenty-five thousand copies. But the truth is, the real breakthrough was Cain and Abel, yeah. and uh, that sold a million copies in the first week and indeed changed my whole life. Since, not a penny more, not a penny less, has sold over 20 million. But not to begin with, Morris, I had as slow a start as anyone else. So I must say to young readers, especially those who've had the courage to write a book during lockdown, do not assume that the publishers will rush after you. Uh, the 17th publisher actually purchased not a penny more, not a penny less, 16 turned me down, and that's not a record because J.K. Rowling had 21 people turn her down. So what I'm saying is don't, don't give up. If you've written something, don't assume the first publisher will want to buy it. Interesting. I, I remember I was out with some friends in London many, many moons ago. Uh, they're in the record business, and uh, they were out for a, for a going to see someone, and they said, do you mind if we stop? I just want to run up and some rickety old stairs to a publisher, a small, tiny little publisher who was publishing books on pop stars and rock stars and, and people in music, celebrity publishing. And his name was young Nigel Newton. Mm. And, and, and Nigel Newton went on, because a little girl came up the stairs called Kay, Kay Rowling, walked up the stairs, must have been the 19th, by the way, or whatever you said, the last one. And he published her book, and now Bloomsbury is doing pretty well. Yes. Yes, indeed. So your point is well made, Morris, that uh, it's one of the great myths that uh, you make it straight away. It's a, a long battle to get published, and it's a long battle to get known. Most of us don't make it till our third or fourth book. You have to actually get established. The readers have to believe in you, and then they build and build uh, if they believe in you. You're obviously quite a comfortable man. Even as a youngster, he invests 400,000, which I don't know what it is in today's money, but must be close to a million, if not more. Um, Several million. Yeah. Well, How did your, uh, you, were you married? You were married to Mary? Yes, I, I, I was married, and Mary was typically loyal and stood by me, though she did think after I'd written Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less, if I remember her words, she thought I should go out and look for a real job. A real job. I was going to say that to you. Yeah, because yeah, what, what makes you think that you are good enough to be a writer uh, or a novelist well, or a storyteller? Job. She was teaching at Oxford at the time, and she thought that was a real job, and indeed, of course, it was. And I think she thought her husband, uh, leaving the House of Commons in debt, unable to pay the bills, really writing wasn't the job to turn to. And I think one would have to have a degree of sympathy with that. Is Mary, is Mary there? Would you like to uh, just have a quick word with me for a second? I want to ask her. At the moment, she's reading to the grandchildren because five o'clock she reads to the grandchildren, which I'm sure you'd approve of. She's well, reading Wind in the Willows to the grandchildren. By, not by Jeffrey Archer, of not course. By not, the by not the rewrite. Kenneth he, Graham? Yeah, he's done quite well. David Williams. By E.H. Shepherd, the great E.H. Shepherd. Now, let me, let me move on from this, because you had to write this book to pick yourself up and move on. 
well, you didn't have to write the book, but this was your choice, uh, your direction after losing all this money. Prior to that, did you did you think you could write a novel? Was it something that was always in your head? Was there a possibility? No, I wanted to be a prime minister, captain of the England cricket team. I didn't mind which. Actually, looking back, I think I'd prefer to be captain of the England cricket team. But I did think the idea, Morris, of four people, four decent, thoroughly decent uh, chaps losing a million between them and coming together. And the thing that brought them together was they discovered who Mr. Big was. And then they would sit down and the four of them, one an art dealer, one of them an academic at Oxford, one of them a lawyer and one of them a politician, sitting down and deciding how we'll get the million back without him knowing. I thought that was quite a good idea, but of course I had no idea if I could write it. Jeffrey, you know, you're, you're a, a, an extraordinary fighter. And I say this because in, uh, was it 2001, 2003, you were, you were in prison for perjury, and yet you turned that into, well, it was a play, wasn't it, which you wrote there, and you were highly well, wrote, admired from what I heard in prison. You were helping prisoners. The play, the play was fine. Actually, five books came out of it because, of course, I picked up so many stories, Morris, and met so many yeah. interesting people. I mean, you couldn't... The, the thing about writing novels is you have to remember that uh, the readers, one, want to turn the page, but two, want people they remember and feel become part of their lives. I mean, I had a letter this morning from a lady talking about the Clifton Chronicles, and she said, I do hope you don't know anyone as evil as Lady Virginia. So there was a woman who actually believed Lady Virginia existed. I mean, I enjoyed writing her, and she was based on three people, not one. But I'm bound to say, yes, you must make your books believable, and the secret is for them to care about the characters. If you look at the great writers of the past, if you look at Dickens and Jane Austen, you remember the names of the characters. You remember the things they did, uh, because, that, because they were two not only great writers, but great storytellers. So you've written a book. You're in, in uh, well, just before we get to the lockdown, uh, before we get to that, Jeffrey, you are a great um, advocate of, or you were against Brexit, totally against Brexit, from what I understand. You were a Remainer. Um, yes. How's your feeling now? Did you get to the point when you said, look, if we're going to do it, let's just get on with it, because the whole thing's turning into a circus? Well, uh, my own attitude is simple. I lost. Uh, get on with it. Uh, I've never agreed with that. Those stupid people voted against me. They must be stupid. I must be clever. That's drivel. I voted to remain. I lost. My to my wife voted to come out. She's a Brexiteer. She won. That's good enough for me. I've always believed you should lose with a degree of dignity. Not say, oh, well, I was right and they were all wrong. <laughs> Not worth it. We lost. Full stop. Get on. Yeah. Well, look, it, as I say, it's great to have it. Let's just, uh, as we sort of wind up this, let's just talk a little bit about uh, lockdown, because lockdown to you it was also, as, as was prison, you, you take an opportunity and you make something of it. Am I right? That's you, Jeffrey. And well, lockdown is time for another book. I was already due to write at that time and had allocated 40 days to be away writing the first draft of a new book because I write 13 or 14 drafts. And the first one, of course, is uh, the heavy lifting. That's the, the big one. But suddenly to discover you've got 80 days, at least, because I'm still here, means that you can take it a bit easier. You can be a bit more calm about it. You can take longer thinking. And so I'm hoping what's come out of it has been very worthwhile. And I suspect, Morris, and I may be wrong, that many people over the years who've said to me, you know, Jeffrey, I've got a book in me. I'm just overworked or I just haven't the time. Or, well, they've had the time now. And I suspect next year, Morris, you'll see some very fine novels coming out of lockdown. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you know, uh, Patterson, I can't remember his first name, but he often co-writes. He gets other people now to write with him. He sold so many billions of books. Uh, what's his name? Patterson. Um, I, I James just Patterson. James Patterson. 
is it something you've often considered? I mean, as you say, many people must write to you with ideas and et cetera, et cetera. Would you ever co-author? No, never. Uh, they asked, they offered me, a, I shall not tell you which company, a distinguished American publishing house offered me four million a year to write four books that I wouldn't write. They would just put my name on the cover. Right. I hated the idea because I like to believe that my readers know me. They know what I'm doing and what I'm at. And they, and they would know immediately I hadn't written it. And they'd all be writing to me saying, you didn't write this, Jeffrey. You just took the money. So no, the answer is, I want to be read. I care about my books. I'm proud of my books. And I will not be co-writing with anyone at any time. Do you enjoy writing still? Love it. Because once you've got a good story and it's in your mind and thrilling you, oh yes, I can't wait to get up in the morning. In fact, I finished tonight in a, in a, in a courtroom in a murder trial and I was, I'd come to the end of the third session, the sixth hour, and I can't wait to get up at six o'clock tomorrow morning. I know where I want to go with it, but I was too tired to give it 100%. But at six o'clock tomorrow morning, I will give it 100%. How do you write? Do you write uh, on computers now, on laptops? Uh, uh, or do you still, because I remember going way back, you used to use a typewriter all the time. But I, I know. A pencil, a pencil. I handwrite every word. Yeah. I couldn't even zoom into you today without Mary. She fixed all the equipment, touched all the buttons, and here I am sitting with you. And as you well know, before we began this interview, it was yeah. Mary on the screen, not me, because she was fixing it all up. She's so fantastic. now I still handwrite every word. Yeah. I like the physical movement of the pen across the paper. I feel that makes you feel you've done it. It's yours. Uh, Mary has tried to convince me. She has all the latest equipment. She has everything, the unit press a button and everything happens. But she's a typical scientist in that way. So uh -huh. she's been way ahead of everybody in the sense that she was doing emails with scientists in California before, before the likes of you knew what an email, or me, knew what an email was. So to her, that's fine. But for me, I still like the pen in my hand. Lord Archer, I'm not going to let you go before you tell us about uh, Nothing Ventured. Uh, is that the newest book or is the newest book the one you're working on now that we don't know the title of? Well, the new one is called Hidden in Plain Sight, but that okay. doesn't come until out until October. Nothing Ventured is the first of a series of books about a young detective called William Warwick, whose father is a distinguished QC, Sir Julian, but his son wants to go into the Metropolitan Police. He wants him to join him in chambers, but he doesn't want to do that. And you're going to follow his life. The first case, nothing ventured, he gets into the arts and antique squad at Scotland Yard and is, uh, they are chasing a missing Rembrandt. The second book, which comes out in uh, October, will be on drugs. So each book, you will see this young man rising in rank, they will all be individual books, rising in rank, but doing a different subject. So the first book was art, the second book, drugs, the third is bent coppers, and the fourth is going to be murder. So I know where I'm going, and I haven't stopped working, and I'm 80 years old. Yeah, absolutely amazing, and uh, keep it up. Of course, you've got a huge, huge fan base. I'm sure you have no intention of stopping. Look, it's, it's always an honour to speak to you, Your Lordship. It really is. And we go back a long, long time. You indeed, Morris. Way back, way back. Way, way, way back. When we were way both back. youngsters, when we were kids. When you were going to be Prime Minister and I was uh, going yes, to be... Yes, and uh, captain of the England cricket team. Uh, and I was going to be the Almighty. Neither of us oh, exactly... Well uh, neither you failed us, as well. Well, I just remember being a child and walking into rooms and people say, oh, Jesus, it's him. And I thought for a long time, maybe it is him. Maybe I am him. But who knows? I enjoy what I'm doing. You enjoy what you're doing. You're healthy. I'm healthy, thank That's God. It's just great to speak to you. And let's hope thank that this lockdown passes quickly for all of us. Oh, let's yeah. hope the scientists come up with a, with a, with a what do you call it? Um, so that we can feel a vaccine, so we can feel safe when we oh, go out. Wouldn't it be wonderful, because that would solve the problem so quickly, and it appears that uh, both Oxford and Imperial College London are doing well, and there's an American company doing very well, and there's a German company doing very well, 
but my wife says we should not get too optimistic because even if they discover it, there will be three months of trials before a government can agree and they will have to show those trials, will have to show they've succeeded. They won't let the general public have the vaccine unless it's ready and perfect. So she, my wife is saying, don't expect anything much before December, January. As soon as this vaccine's out there, my arm goes out like that and says, Please. stick it in. I'm with you. <laughs> with that, Jeffrey, I say God bless you. Thank you. A huge thank you, thank you to Mary. And of course, Alison, your, uh, your, your wonderful secretary for setting this up with you. And uh, enjoy the rest of the lockdown. Uh, lockdown. Uh, finish off your book and get it out in the market and let everyone start reading it. Jeffrey Archer, Lord Jeffrey Archer, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You,